installment of our mini-series on, it sounds like a TV show, <laughs> Religion and Pop Culture. Um, before we formally get started, shall we pray? This is a good British way of saying, we're going to pray. <laughs> our loving Heavenly Father, we thank you for your grace towards us in the Lord Jesus, the gift of your spirit. We thank you that you're a Lord over all, that you are the great artist, uh, that you are the great visionary. And so uh, open our hearts and minds to receive your goodness and uh, grant us the wisdom and moral courage to challenge those things which are not a part of your good creation, not a part of your goodness towards us. So help us uh, this evening and bless everyone here and everyone on the other side of the camera too. In Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, so the image that we have on the screen here uh, is a very famous image to any of you. Well, I shouldn't say that. Why don't I just ask a general question? Does anyone recognize the image that's on the screen? I think I do. Okay. Is that from 2001, it's from <coughs> Space Odyssey? Yeah, it's from 2001, a Space Odyssey. It came out in 1968. I was seven years old. I saw it in the Roxy Theater on 124th Street. It scared the crap out of me. <laughs> I had no idea, but it's worse now that I'm an adult. It scares me more because <laughs> now I understand the philosophy behind it. Yeah. Uh, it's uh, the music that's used is Elsa Sprach's "Ela Fusta." Uh, it's a tone poem. Um, this is a monolith that represents some kind of alien uh, force or presence, which uh, inevitably leads us to our origins and um, perhaps the meaning of life. It is a completely secular film. It is based on Nietzsche. Uh, that's why Richard Strauss's Alsa Sprach's Zarathustra was used. That's a tome poem based on his book. And essentially, it's uh, about how most people are sheep and a herd mentality you've heard of. And that uh, it's one of the problems that Nietzsche had with Christians. And he was a Lutheran pastor's kid. I hope my kid doesn't turn out like him, but. Um, <laughs> He uh, came to conclude that Christians were weak, and they weren't thinking, they were sheep, they were, had herd mentality. And what you needed to become was Uberman, uh, to become Superman, uh, to be excellent at everything that you do. And so this is the philosophy that's embedded in the secular, it is uh, bordering on atheism, albeit we're going to see lots of irony. So I've talked about how Canada and the West, we are post-Christian, perhaps, but we are not post-religious. Religion is all around you, and that's why I'm presenting this course to you. So, but once we start to understand uh, what the philosophy is behind it, we can see ironies like the star child at the end of it, um, which is, uh, is the birth of the Uberman. Essentially saying, uh, by our own ingenuity, by our own intelligence, by our own technology, uh, we can save ourselves. Uh, actually, we don't need salvation. Um, we're just good to go. So if you, we're going to have uh, Melissa Moore come. She's going to do a little, her presentation on uh, the mall as church next week, but we'll also look at Blade Runner. If you get a chance to watch that movie, please do. That's your homework for next week. Um, but as we are going to see, there is, we are being messaged all the time. And I'll make this point very clear. Hollywood is not neutral, nor is it value-free. Um, I'm really bemoaning some of the things that have been foisted upon us and how my freedom of conscience and my freedom of speech are being tyrannically suppressed. Um, and most of it we can blame on Hollywood or certainly pop culture. So I think I mentioned last week, give a man a fish and you'll feed him for a day, show people how to watch movies and they'll be able to pick up all kinds of stuff uh, in the movies. So let's first of all look at the movie industry and its influence. First of all, we have to look at movies and money. Do you want me to flick it or? Okay. Uh, the Motion Picture Association of America, uh, their 2011 statistics, the theatrical mar market statistics say that worldwide their revenue was $32.6 billion. 
Now, I know it was 1975, but it cost $5 billion to build uh, Syncrude up on Fort McMurray. Again, it's a few years ago, but it's, I think it does provide some kind of scale. What most people don't know is Bollywood. Bollywood uh, makes $16 billion. Uh, dollars. So, uh, it, when I was living in Scotland in the 90s, we only had four channels. We had BBC One, BBC Two, we had ITV, and then we had Channel Four. And just as we were leaving, that uh, Channel Five. Uh, but the BBC, I loved them at Christmas time, because we'd be in our pajamas for ten straight days, watching movie after movie with no commercials, because of course you pay a, a, a TV tax there. Um, but we got to watch on Friday nights, there was Bollywood movies. So they love uh, Indian movies there. We love Indian food uh, because Glaswegians, there's, a very, there's more uh, curry shops in Glasgow than there are fish and chip shops. Mm -hmm. So it's very, very popular there. But it, I, I love Bollywood movies. Uh, often they're about gangsters. They like to tell gangster stories. And so, but the thing is, is you have this really serious, heavy, uh, extortion thing going on, and they break out of Ted Towns. Like, uh, <laughs> like guys and dolls. Yeah, it was unbelievable. But that's $16 billion. Um, two thirds of North Americans, 221 million, went to the movies at least once in 2011. 10% uh, uh, of the population uh, bought 50% of the tickets. Uh, men and women are about equal. And the bottom line is, money talks, and money is power. Let's look at movies and cultural influence. Um, so this is uh, Trisha Heffler. She's from Alberta. Did you know that? No. Uh, she was discovered. I think it's. I think it was in Brooks, Alberta. She was discovered outside the uh, movie theater of all places, <laughs> and uh, she was in Battlestar Galactica. Uh, one of the things, uh, I deal quite a bit with this in ancient Near Eastern religions, but also a lot in religion and pop culture, is body image. <clears throat> because, and, and I feel particularly troubled for women, um, because the facts are, not only in movies, but in marketing and advertising, you're looking at a fraction of 1% of the population that's on 99% of the images, billboards, movies, etc. And most women don't look like that. Um, it's like, what, we're adults, right? I know this is seminary, but we're adults. What are breasts? Breasts are fat. So, uh, what are the chances of having a very skinny woman with large breasts? It's very, very low. It does happen. Sometimes it can be enhanced. Uh, but this is the body images that are, women are perpetually bombarded with and they suffer terribly from low self-esteem, especially in relation to body image. Well, I think we can blame a, a great deal of that on Hollywood. Uh, materialism and spending habits, I think this is Tom Cruise's uh, mansion, one of them. I'm sure he has many. And uh, there used to be a show called Lifestyles of the Rich and Famous. Uh, and you got to see all these, again, you're looking at 1% of the population that are fabulously wealthy. So it's a statistical uh, anomaly. And we want to live like the Hollywood stars. We have to have a pool, we have to have big houses, etc., etc. Um, moral values. So when I was growing up in the 60s, I only knew two kids that grew up in broken families. And by the way, when I talk about this, I have nothing but compassion, nothing but empathy. I don't think divorce is the unpardonable sin, and I have a zero tolerance for abuse, whether it's physical, mental, emotional, sexual, or whatever. Zero. People deserve to be treated with dignity and with respect. Um, and so, uh, but... Hollywood, where, where did divorce become big? In Hollywood. It was Hollywood people. Stars and starlets. How many, how many husbands did Mae West have? <laughs> or Elizabeth Taylor, mm -hmm. Shasha Gabor. Uh, and we can talk about dudes as well. Mm -hmm. So, why now is the general population's divorce rate about the same as what we have in Hollywood? About 50%. Uh, also, our sexual mores. Uh, where do they come from? We, get, we are living in a more and more permissive society all the time. And so now we have, uh, we have um, 
uh, warnings there, uh, rating systems, uh, and essentially what it's doing is it's telling us what's permissible or not. If, well, if you don't want to go, it's a free country, and if you don't like it, well, you don't have to show up. Uh, it's kind of like uh, the legalization of prostitution, you know, saying that, well, it's happening anyway, so we should just regulate it. Uh, what we know from human nature is uh, when we have standards up here, we shoot lower than that. When we lower our standards, we shoot lower than that. You know where this is going, right? And then eventually we're wallowing in the mud with the pigs. Um, so this is a big part of Hollywood speech patterns. What about potty mouth? Particularly women. So this started uh, particularly in the UK in the 90s. It's called girly culture. Uh, I can be a sexually aggressive potty mouth and uh, uh, obnoxious as men. This is the new feminist, especially when I'm drunk, right? Uh, so now profanity is really, really uh, widespread. Uh, now you can essentially say anything you want on TV. As long as you put that little warning up, you're good to go. Right, so back to the idea that the rating system, uh, it's now telling us what is permissible. Also, Politics. Do you think Hollywood and movies are influential in politics? <laughs> so yeah, Michael Moore um, is not all wrong all the time, but some people are right even in spite of themselves, etc. Uh, but uh, Hollywood lobbies, and they have a lot of influence on elections, uh, etc. And we can apply the same thing to television as well. Television has a lot of influence. So I just spent uh, this. August, watching uh, Game of Thrones, I'm right up to speed and everything. Uh, it's not for the faint of heart, uh, I would say, but TV is also very influential. The bottom line is, is that movies are neither neutral nor value-free, politically or morally. In a few minutes, we'll talk a little bit more about how movies are effective. They affect us emotionally long before we're even caught up. Intellectually, and of course, most people don't go to movies to think. By the way, and we'll talk about that. So this leads us into introduction of theology of the movies, um, which is a relatively new discipline. Uh, it's we had the little seedlings in the 1960s. Uh, that was partly the effect of Vatican II, which had a more openness to the modern world. They stopped doing the mass and Latin, and trying to just open up a little bit. Uh, and then you see where the slide went. Just kidding. Uh, we had Jones who had Sunday night of the movies uh, in 1967 because less and less people were going to church, so this was the replacement for it. The first real attempt at uh, theology of the movies was Hurley. Uh, he wrote a famous book called Theology Through Film. It was later renamed Towards a New Humanism. But since the 1990s, there's been a total explosion um, of the discipline, and I've given you a little select bibliography. This is, this is, that is select, that is such a small sample of what's out there. Okay. When was Hurley's book? You know what? Is it not on there? It's not on there. The students always catch you out, don't they? <laughs> you can Google it. <laughs> Christian perspective, so I'm going to quote uh, Tertullian here. Tertullian said, what does, Athens, what does Jerusalem have to do with Athens? And what he means is, what does theology, biblical theology, have to do with philosophy? Um, actually, quite a bit, it's just Athens doesn't know it. But I reframe this question, what has Jerusalem do, to do with Hollywood? They look like they have quite different values, quite different approaches, uh, uh, standards, etc. So originally, uh, Christians were closed, uh, uh, closed off, they were antagonistic towards movie, and there was a moral critique. <coughs> and by the way, that's not all bad. I still think that we should be doing that all the time. Um, we see that today, uh, and we, in a lecture, we must always speak in generalities. I try to define important terms. I try to qualify. I will always give you a variety of different positions. doesn't matter what subject I'm looking at. Um, 
So in general, we can say that both liberal and, and conservative Christians are open, but they have different uh, approaches, boundaries, and values. Having said all that, it raises the question of legitimacy. Like, isn't it just done by academics and theologians who like watching movies? Yeah, I'm being a little bit funny there, but uh, there's some serious truth to that. And I think that we do have to be careful. So remember the little article on the thinking Christian. We must always be engaged in praying without ceasing. This is when we invite God into our thought processes. But when we see the world holistically as God is operational in all of it, we need to be discerning the weak from the chaff, the good from the bad, etc. Okay, uh, we're going to look at uh, Marsh's uh, uh, piece here on uh, dealing with what films actually do to people. And he came to four conclusions based on statistical data. First of all, <laughs> moviegoers get a lot more than they expect because the number one reason why people go to movies is for fun. Followed by they want to escape. They want to be entertained. That's why I won't go see Schindler's List. First of all, I resent paying money for a black and white movie. <laughs> well, that's stylistic, I get it, but I, I'm Scottish and I want to get value for money. Right now. And I have I have watched tons of documentaries on the Holocaust, but somehow I, in my heart, it I just maybe because I movies affect me the way that I think of them as entertainment. They are entertainment but I can't quite <coughs> reconcile those two, two things. We'll come back to that a bit later on. So you go to the movies to be entertained, to have a feel-good factor. What you don't go to the movies for is to be challenged or to learn stuff. This is what we know from the statistical information. But there is a built-in <coughs> tension that recognizes movies do ask big questions and they do impact our thinking. There's lots of this. 2001 comes to mind. Blade Runner is another one. The Matrix. Uh, we'll look at Light of Day uh, in a minute by Paul Schrader. We'll run a clip from that. Um, Avatar. It has an impact on our thinking. And um, the light. Crash. Another movie that asks big questions about racism, about man's inhumanity to man, um, sexual relationships between men and women, um, and other kinds of relationships. Um, so at least somewhere people recognize that, that movies are impactful. Movies, entertainment, are replacing religion for meaning making. This is one of the most shocking things that you can imagine. And the last poll in the United Kingdom, 17% of Brits said, quoted their religion as Jedi. <laughs> Jedi. Seriously. Yeah. Now, it's, uh, on the one hand, that's, uh, that's giving the finger to the government. My religion is none of your business. But it's also giving uh, the finger to religion as well. It's very disrespectful. And some of them, are, they're just not taking it seriously at all. <clears throat> so, um, this, this idea, however, comes out of the fun side. Because what happens in movies, we encounter issues. The mind is challenged. Um, we also have personal psychological and sociological development. So, um, in my fuller a religion and pop culture course. I spend two lectures on psychology of religion. And I look at that personal religious experience. Later on, we'll talk about Paul Schrader uh, and his movies. Uh, and he talks about the transcendental art of movie making. Uh, he's saying that there is something transcendental about uh, movies. Uh, my question would be uh, are these valid religious experiences? 
I talked about that a little bit in the first day, uh, like near-death experiences, and how uh, we have this phenomenon across the world. At the point of death, people, they see a white light, and at the end of the tunnel, whoever is at the end of the tunnel depends on where we were born, what our religion is, etc. And so I concluded, before I saw the medical correspondent from 2020, um, say it's a biochemical reaction in the brain. Because remember, I want to be an instrument-rated Christian. I want to only look at the instruments. I want to know that scripture is always the benchmark by which we measure truth, morals, and values. So, do I think a person can have a religious experience that's valid watching movies? Yeah, I think we can. I remember that when I was 17 and I wanted to be an atheist. When I sat down, I was watching uh, Cecil B. DeMille's The Ten Commandments. A movie I've seen a number of times before. Of course, I was drinking. <laughs> and I just remember saying, I wish you were real God. I just think you remember this. I wish you were a real God because I'm very grateful for what I, for what I had. And, and I'm really grateful. Took me a couple more years, but God. And actually, that was the other thing. Uh, and my little article on "In the World, Not of the World," I start with that. Um, God first started speaking to me um, through His Holy Spirit through the movie Friday the Thirteenth and a song by Deep Purple called "Our Lady." Um, and that is, I'm perfectly literal there. Uh, because those two things open my heart, my mind, to the metaphysical, to something beyond materialism, naturalism, etc. And it wasn't for another year. I also remember too. This is well, it's not. It's not along the idea of movies or pop culture, but yeah, I remember this guy. Yeah, we'll just leave it at that. So God spoke to me through the movie Friday the 13th. I believe that was a genuine spiritual experience. They're also looking to movies for guidance in life, direction in life. Uh, where am I going? Uh, what should I do? Now, we have different kinds of meaning making at work. So we live in a Western culture. That's very different from a third world culture. Um, but that is our interpretive framework. So again, we are being messaged, we are being programmed culturally and in terms of worldview all the time. It is not primarily cognitive. So again, people are not thinking about these things. It's not philosophical, it's not theological, and it's not coherent. So again, we can see Christian themes in the movie The Matrix, uh, but it is not a Christian movie by any stretch of the imagination. It's really a postmodern um, religious movie. There's all kinds of ideas in there. They just happen to be mutually exclusive truth claims. But we live in the Western culture where postmodernism has finally uh, won and where people, they don't want to think, they want to feel. And um, inclusiveness is a part of our values. Pluralism is a part of our context. So all ideas are equal and we're open to them all. But people aren't actually thinking about, is that actually true? Is that actually valid? So that's what I was just talking about. This meaning making, it doesn't take place in a vacuum. It's not inert, uh, but it is very, um, um, profoundly impingent upon us. It is dislocated from traditional religion, which is viewed at, viewed at negatively. And I have a lot of empathy for people that have problems with the church and Christianity and formal religion, because, yeah, there's some bad stuff in it, for sure. Actually, when I show you this Paul Schrader movie, a clip, uh, he grew up in a very strict Calvinistic home in Grand Rapids, Michigan, which is Calvinistic. Um, by the way, I seem to have spoken about Calvin more times in this lecture, this seminary, than I do like in the whole course, all my other courses put together. But anyways, Paul Schrader, but 
he's a Calvinist, so it can't be a coincidence that he's actually a Calvinist. We'll talk about that later as well. But um, he's had some negative experiences with church and his Christian upbringing, and we're going to see this played out in a very, very powerful scene. Uh, it's also what I call Tim Horton's philosophy. Or, uh, I'm religious, not I'm spiritual, not religious. It's free from traditional uh, worship. Uh, it's free from text, like the Bible. Uh, it's free from liturgy. In essence, we they want to be free, and they just make it up as they go along. Well, things like movies and other stuff in pop culture are actually influencing us. Note that all of this is very subjective and touchy-feely. So I, the only other person I know that talks about postmodernism uh, in this, these, this term is Nancy Percy. And that's, I kind of think of postmodernism as neo-romanticism. Uh, people don't want to think, I mean, romanticism was a 19th century response to the Enlightenment, the age of reason, uh, where you've got to keep your emotions out of things. Um, and that it has to be objective. Well, romanticism is very uh, subjective. It's all about experience. Um, and um, we make up truth and experience truth um, as we want to. So we can make it up as we go along. And with the arrogance that we can't be touched, criticized. I deal with this every day in the classroom, particularly in religion and pop culture. People sign up and they think it's going to be a really fun course. Well, I think it is a really fun course. It's also the hardest course I teach. It's all interdisciplinary, and you can't just say whatever you want. Academic freedom doesn't mean you can say whatever you want. Uh, Hamlet is not a play about a Scottish king. It's not. It's an objective fact. Uh, two plus two does not equal seven. That's a fact. It's an objective fact. But because we live in a pluralistic context, all opinions are equal. Wrong, I tell my class. Wrong. And don't hand in a paper like that, because you have to demonstrate critical thinking in it. Um, so, and actually, they think they're free, but they just put themselves into bondage of something else. Okay. Ironically, however, postmodern actually fuels an interest in spirituality, in the metaphysical. Uh, it's partly what the zombie craze is about, uh, theology of the movies is about, um, it's what the cult of Oprah is about. I'm really having a hard time with Oprah. <laughs> Super Soul Sunday, and now this seven part documentary on belief. And, Mm, okay, we're in a seminary context. Uh, my sister wants to know why I hate her so much. Well, I don't particularly hate her, but it's because I think she's a false prophet. And I think she's an antichrist. An antichrist is anyone that denies Christ. And that's, that's what she does. And she's leading millions and millions of people away. Um, okay, having said that, people have figured out that were more than six bucks of chemicals in a couple of gallons of water. They figured out that materialism and natural science cannot explain everything. Remember Kevin Sherwood? Where are we going? That's your, uh, it's not in there. Um, where do I go after I die? Where am I going in life? Meaning, to, uh, uh, et cetera. Okay, it's not neutral. It's value-laden, and it is ideologically driven. So the messages all the time, no, I'm speaking in generalities here in a lecture. Pluralism, inclusivism, democratic equality, free morality, permissiveness, um, underpinned by uh, a philosophy of individualism, freedom, and choice. Well, talk to Bill Freed over at Concordia. He's a mathematician. He believes in mathematical determinism that things are absolutely determined by numbers. And there's a very strong case for that. I have no clue, I have no clue freedom, determinism, no clue how it all works. Um, it's one of the things that The Walking Dead really challenges. Uh, it's challenging the American dream based on individualism and freedom and choice. 
Rick has no choice. He just wakes up and the zombie apocalypse has happened. Uh, people get overrun by zombies. Uh, they are not, we're not in control of our lives. And we can't survive by ourselves. We need community. So, at least intuitively, people are figuring this out. Um, we see this in the movie Brave, by the way, some of the philosophical um, underpinning. Uh, another example would be Braveheart. Braveheart was a great Scottish hero that I grew up with. My father told me all the stories of William Wallace. I've been to his monument in Stirling many, many times, taken my son there, seen his claymore, uh, etc. Um, Braveheart and Brave are not about the American dream. Freedom! This is an alien concept uh, for feudal uh, Britain at that time. Uh, and it's the same thing in Brave. Um, and this is also something that Nancy Burse, Percy raises in her book, um, uh, 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 Saving Leonardo, a, a call to resist the moral assault on our values. Okay, fourth. Uh, there is resistance to social control and didacticism, to teaching. So everyone wants to be an individual. Everyone wants to do whatever the hell they want. <laughs> so it used to be, I just taught the lecture on judges in Old Testament literature there. And I start with the Sex Pistols, Anarchy in the UK. Uh, I'm actually an anarchist. Um, I'm a, but Anarchy, true philosophical anarchy is based on the fact that you're an adult, you're a mature, responsible adult, you know what the rules are, uh, you do what you, you do. nobody tells me what time to get up in the morning. Nobody tells me what I need to do at work. Nobody's watching the clock with me. I'm an adult and I'm a professional. And I do what I'm supposed to do because I don't like getting crap from people. I don't know how you feel about that. Fine. Um, now we have this whole permissiveness where uh, it's just whatever goes. So it used to be, I can do whatever I want as long as it doesn't hurt somebody. Now it's I can do whatever I want even if it does hurt somebody. You know? So the example I use is, and people don't even know what the rules are. Why do I have to tell my, my neighbor, why do I have to ask her, please don't let your dog poop on our property? A, she doesn't know what the rule is, and is there an apology for that? No. People don't even know what the rules are anymore. And they don't care anyways, because they protect their property, their boundary. What's, forgive us our trespasses. What is it? It's crossing a boundary. Um, and now it just, it's all completely self-indulgent. This, it is a delusion that dupes movie go goers into thinking they are not uh, being influenced or educated. That is programmed. So, we have friends at home school. My wife and I, this is why I've never been invited back to Braveforth. I talked about it in my little paper. There's 350 people in there. And I know some of you homeschool here. If that's what you feel God has called you to do, I have no problems with that. We don't do it because it didn't, doesn't teach our 10-year-old, he's now a 17-year-old, how to navigate the moral minefield that we're in. And my son consistently shows that he makes good choice, choices. Like, remember, did we talk about watching Cheech and Chong? <laughs> My wife was really mad when we watched Cheech and Chong. He was 14 at the time. I says, Liam, tell your mother what you learned from watching Cheech and Chong. Drugs are really, really stupid and I'll never ever do them. And it was a hilarious movie. Okay. But uh, we have taught him to be his own man, to do his own thinking. He is an independent, critical thinker. Um, you see that like with Katy Perry, she grew up in a strict homeschool environment. Both of her parents are Pentecostal pastors, etc. And uh, now she's denounced her faith. She kissed a girl and she liked it. And she says, uh, I never even knew that these things existed. And she went right off the rails. So uh, it is a delusion that we are not being influenced and programmed. We are being programmed all the time. But they don't want to be preached to or compelled, especially when they're trying to enjoy themselves. You know? Because movies are about fun. What are the results of the survey? What's the data? It evidenced that meaning making was taking place anyways. 
that meaning making was philosophical, theological, and ethical. Pluralism. There are many ways to God. The arrogance of the Christian faith, saying it's the one and only true religion, which of course is the actual opposite. Because if you're saved by grace, you have zero to brag about. It's not a choice, it's not a decision. When God comes to us in our baptisms as a little baby, what does a baby do to be saved? Zero, nothing, nada. It most, most exemplifies uh, being saved by grace. Um, but now, again, like in the Matrix and other movies, or even uh, things like in the Terminator series, why do we have all these movies with apocalyptic, they're essentially the book of Revelation, but God's not even on the radar. So I was just reading a little article on the commodification of religion in movies, and that's one of the things that they do. So Walsh uh, talks about horror of horrors, uh, how um, movies, companies have ripped off the Bible and apocalyptic themes, they've jettisoned God from it, and all they're doing is making money off of that. Um, but one of the uh, implied questions or issues there is that um, what we're really afraid of is that there might be a day of accounting. Our worst nightmare, the worst horror for our society is that Christianity is true and that we will face a great white judgment. Okay. Even, all of this is happening even if they are resistant to the ideas. And we'll talk more about that in, in a moment, why that happens. Okay, Johnson on theological approaches to film. So, um, you've got this little handout here. Uh, he argues uh, in his book that there are five postures and directions. So, um, the first posture is avoidance. So, this view... Uh, looks at movies as a threat. And uh, by the way, this position is not all wrong. So I have, I have a great, this is another case in point where um, in a cloistered environment with no exposure to the real world, they go out, out into the real world and they're completely subsumed by it. But I have a lot of respect for the monast monasticism and Amish, I get the idea of holiness as something that I take extremely seriously. Um, so the position is not all wrong. Then you can kind of kick it up a notch to where you get to caution. So it starts with the sound knowledge of self and human nature. So again, in my view, when I read Genesis 3 and I look at the world, it just lines up. It just makes perfect sense to me why we are the way we are, why, why we have the attitudes we do, and why we behave the way we do. It proceeds with skepticism. So, <clears throat> skepticism um, is a very important scholarly tool. And I approach all texts and all information with skepticism. And I don't, it doesn't matter where it's coming from. Uh, I'm always a little bit skeptical of David in the Bible. He's a man after God's own heart. Mm, that raises some kind of painful questions and issues uh, and the like. Um, but skepticism essentially doubts everything that you're being told and questions everything. Uh, I do have to remind Paul Beach, who's one of the philosophers over there, this is public knowledge, uh, that we can't be skeptical just for the sake of being skeptical. Because that's how some people uh, dodge out of the issues, uh, how they get out from under the implications of, of what's burdening them. So here though the tendency is to set up clear boundaries between church and Hollywood. Okay, the third uh, uh, posture and direction is dialogue. Um, first of all what we have to do is have a suspension of theology. I should maybe put that point first. That's a little play on words because if you know film studies you have to have a suspension of disbelief. John and Liam hate watching movies or TV shows with me. It's like, ah, oh, Bill, just go with it. But I have to question, I have to doubt it. 
and just talk about what's built into the premises, etc. So I, I have to suspend disbelief. Uh, so for example, in a, in a long time ago in a galaxy far, far away, you have to suspend disbelief that, well, it's not real. <laughs> <laughs> you just have to go with it. Same it thing. starts like a fairy tale. Well, it does, indeed, <laughs> indeed. Um, the point of this is we must watch the piece of art, the movie, on its own terms. We have to let it speak for itself. So the article I just sent off to a publisher looks at the um, pluralism project at Harvard. And uh, they have an accurate sense of tolerance and um, uh, which says, we're not asking people to uh, jettison their beliefs. They come with commitments, but we have to understand them on their own terms. So one of the arguments I make there is that it is important to have open and real dialogue with people without judging them, to be open to their points of view, if we want to really evangelize, to tailor our evangelism and to reach them. Because otherwise the walls will just go straight up. And we can't actually tailor our evangelism uh, to help them. Um, having said all that, I, I still can't suspend theology. I'm always thinking as a theologian. It's, it's just the way I roll. But that comes back to a holistic worldview. I think God is in the movies. I think he's here with us tonight. Um, well, he's omnipresent, isn't he? Wow. God was here and I wasn't even aware of it. <laughs> okay. So um, we have to let the movie's own images suggest meaning and direction. So theology follows, not precedes aesthetic. Well, we'll look at some imagery from Avatar in, in shortly. It's a very beautiful film. Um, and that is purposeful. And it's beautiful. Uh, but that also has a political agenda attached to it. And then, to complete the process, then we do a theological analysis. The fourth uh, posture is appropriation. And uh, I don't know, in, in my other course I talk about this. this uh, didn't we talk about this before? Yeah, Van Gogh? Yeah. Yeah, and uh, the two books. So we need special revelation of scripture, uh, but there is also general revelation that God is speaking to all people in all places at all times. Um, so, art, literature, movies can expand the theologian's understanding, and this is dialogue informing each other. It's kind of interesting, if you talk with missionaries, sometimes they have a little bit different take on things. And they've been immersed in other cultural contexts and they face other specific kinds of challenges that that cultural context raises in relation to mission and the gospel. Um, but that is why it's important to, um, to have this ongoing dialogue. Okay, there, there is a focus on humanity. It's kind of like the Renaissance. Uh, we can look at this in turn to can compare with theological uh, anthropology. So the three main categories of systematic theology or theology proper, that stuff which talks about God specifically. Uh, anthropology which looks at human nature, uh, origins, nature, etc. And then soteriology, how we're saved. Um, and so uh, theological anthropology looks at you know, how, how are we built. And so uh, we see this uh, in the movie Blade Runner. Because one of the big questions that it raises is, what does it mean to be human? So I was teaching the Gilgamesh epic last week, and I, I sh Gilgamesh is about this guy going through a midlife crisis. He hooks up with this animal named Enkidu. They get drunk, they go to parties, go to parties, they beat people up, they do other things with <laughs> naughty stuff, etc. And, uh, but then Enkidu dies. That's Gilgamesh's best friend. I've talked, I think, a little bit about that. And I ran the scene where Spock and the Wrath of Khan dies. And the friendship that Kirk and Spock uh, had. Um, but when they were burying Spock at space, which is because they're in the starship rather than the sea, uh, Kirk, in his eulogy, says he was the most human. 
in all the places I've traveled in the galaxy, he was the most human. And part of that relates to the fact that, uh, uh, well, it's a bit complicated because you have to have a suspension of disbelief with Spock as well, because he does get emotional, doesn't he, sometimes, etc. But And uh, if you watch a Homicide Hunter, uh, Lieutenant Kendra, uh, he, he talks about uh, what leads to murder is emotions, emotions that get out of control. And so you look at the hatred and lust and pride uh, that has uh, ravaged our world. Um, and it's all driven by emotions. Um, so it also relates to the idea of, well, the image of God. What, is it, what does it mean to be human? Oh, um, I meant to say, because uh, Roy and Chris are uh, not humans. They are um, cybernetic organisms. They're, they have flesh, but they're essentially robots. Um, and they're really struggling because they start to have emotions. Like, do they really love each other? Well, it, it really appears like they do. And if they have emotions, should we really be terminating them? Uh, which is what Harrison Ford's character does. Um, to be human, is it just a body? Uh, so when it says, love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, in Hebrew, that means a total unit. It's with your totality. Um, so this is Lilu. She is the Christ figure in, um, in the movie The Fifth Element. And I just, there was a brilliant uh, presentation on that movie. But again, most women don't look like this. And uh, that's a savior you can fall in love with, right? I'm just kidding. <laughs> so, uh, but we do have bodies. Uh, emotions. Uh, a big issue in uh, Blade Runner is memories. I'm not really sure about this. Is that essential to what it means to be human, to remember? Um, but it is a big issue in Blade Runner. So we need to look a little bit. Right. So this is Rachel. And she uh, is a replicant. Uh, she's actually a robot, but she's a newer model. And she has higher functioning. And she is looking at photographs of her mother, and her mother taught her to play the piano. And that never happened. Those were implanted memories. And so it raises all these kinds of questions. Freedom. So Roy, uh, he is a prisoner. We'll talk more about this next week. He has a four-year lifespan. Uh, it's also interesting because what you really see in really Scott's movie, Blade Runner, is how he really, what he really believes about God. He also gave us Prometheus, which is a parallel of Genesis 1 through 11. And essentially, he thinks that God is a very mean, spirited thing that limits us, that all it wants to do is kill us, uh, etc. And I think a very important point is the idea of people being messed up. So again, when I read Genesis 3 and I look at the world, and I watch the movies like Crash. Uh, this is really a movie that's telling us how screwed up we are. And it's powerful stuff. So again, when I look at Genesis 3, it makes sense to me. So we have to let movies speak of humanity on its own authentic terms, not necessarily theological terms. And this relates back to the idea of God's general revelation. Okay, I'm just going to finish this section. And then we have a break. Um, divine encounter, so typology. Um, Melissa Buck, Kai Buck's wife, is writing her master's thesis with me right now. And she's looking at uh, typological and illusion reading of Ezekiel 37 and John 37. And it's like, it's just turning out amazing. I mean, it's, I'm learning a lot from from her research and what we're doing in our supervisions there. Uh, typology essentially says that there is a type in the Old Testament that finds greater significance or uh, theological meaning in the New Testament. So the Akeda, the near sacrifice of Isaac. I want you to take your son, your only son whom you love. That's not a coincidence. Uh, and so Jesus is the real sacrifice. He is the real son of God. 
uh, that's a typology. Or the tabernacle in Hebrews is, is a model of, of what's actually in heaven. So, but heaven is superior to that. Also, long gospel. Uh, Got to get the bad news before we get the good news. When I watch Crash, it is just a dead end. There's no gospel of Crash. It just describes our humanity as individuals and as a society in our marital and familiar uh, relationships. It's a dead end. But when I watch Robocop, we see typology here. Uh, where this postmodern, uh, apocalyptic, end time savior, uh, it's not a coincidence. So, this is the scene in the movie uh, where he's coming to save his friend and they think he's dead. Uh, I'll go back a bit. And so, if you notice, he's actually walking on the water. That's not a coincidence. So, that's Paul Verhoeven again. <laughs> his faith is of a dubious sort. He's a big bankroller of the Jesus Center, which I have nothing but problems with. But anyways, there's a glimmer of salvation from the dystopia of our own makings. So again, Robocop leads us to Detroit City uh, when all order is broken down and uh, there seems to be little uh, hope because, yeah, and then you can flip. So here we see typology in the sense of Robocop but I get excited about this because what people are really looking for is Jesus. Jesus is the superior uh, typological fulfillment. We have a savior figure in a movie, but he can't even come close to the real deal. Okay. Um, sacramental, just about, uh, this is kind of Roman Catholic uh, theology. Uh, Thomas Aquinas specifically, the idea of uh, general revelation having a sacramental uh, capacity of it. And this relates to the power of aesthetic to experience the trans transcendental, uh, that which is beyond us. So again, it could be argued like in Robocop, uh, it, it transcends mere uh, beauty of the film. Prometheus is another one. So David is another Spock figure. Uh, he's a human kind of character, but it is an absolutely beautiful movie uh, to look at. And there is, it is, it is moving. It's like an Avatar as well. It's such a beautiful looking movie that it takes you beyond uh, day to day life. And all of that is based in common grace. The rain falls on the righteous and the wicked alike. And do I want to talk about? Yeah, I'm gonna. I'll just finish up with Paul Schrader here. So that's Paul Schrader. Um, as I mentioned, he grew up in a very strict Calvinist home. He's most famous for his movies *Taxi Driver*, *American Gigolo*, and *Light of Day*, which I'm going to show you a clip of in a second. So, uh, but he's a lapsed Calvinist. That's predestined. It's predestined. <laughs> it's like. It's like the Calvinist who fell down the stairs and he's picking himself up and says, thank God that's over. <laughs> okay. Paul Schrader, we're going to talk, <laughs> we're going to talk about uh, his, uh, his master's thesis at UCLA uh, when we come back. Um, movies have two universal contingencies. They're connected. The desire to express the transcendental in art and the movie, uh, the medium of movie. Or uh, Van der Luz says, art can be religious. So I showed you some of Charles Rennie Macintosh's interior design. Uh, I just so clearly see God in that aesthetic, in that beauty. Um, and this is partly what Paul Schrader is going to argue. So let's have a break, come back at uh, 8 after, I guess. Yeah, I'm going to think about running that clip. Do you have any questions or comments? <laughs> All sounds good. We're all buying it. Oh, you shouldn't be buying it. You should be skeptical. You're doubting and questioning everything I. Yeah, but we have one more minute. I hope you have one more minute.
I said eight when I saw it. And my watch says it's 8.07. Now it's 8.08. Okay. okay. Do you want to okay. Just to stop for it, sir. 0.5 then. Which is 2. Are you ready? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Excuse me. So now we're going to look at Graham on uses of film and theology. Um, so we'll start off by looking at film as a medium in theology. So to begin with, uh, there's often a false dichotomy uh, that's presented that film and theology don't mix. Um, I have to compare that again with the idea of a holistic worldview, that God is involved in, in all things. Um, I'm just thinking about, uh, we watched The Passion of the Christ on uh, Easter Friday. Um, and, uh, good Friday. I'm <laughs> <laughs> my metaphor, sorry. And uh, we were planning to watch that with Liam for a while, like for two or three years, but somehow we just didn't get around to it. So we eventually watched it. And uh, the movie is so ridiculous in so many different ways. Uh, like. Like four healthy Roman soldiers can't pick up that cross, but Jesus, who's been pulverized, has got to drag that cross. And, and the cross is just ridiculously big, etc. I was definitely having a religious experience, and there, there's something I hadn't seen it for uh, a number of years. We, we saw it when I was in the theater. Yeah. Uh, when I went to the box office, it says I'll be 13.75 each. I says I came to watch a crucifixion, not to be crucified at the box office. <laughs> I, I actually said that. <laughs> um, it's one of the reasons I just I don't like going to movies because I hate being ripped off. Yeah. And besides that, I have a big screen TV and surround sound, so <laughs> and you can pause and go pee and stuff like. Maybe that's too much info, but you can pause and that sort of thing. Um, but there's a number of scenes that are just so powerful, like uh, where he's going down the Via della Rosa, and um, his mother is, comes face to face with him. He says, "See, mother, I make all the things new." And I think the scenes with Mary and the Pietà. Um, Powerful. And of course, we all know Mel Gibson's a bit of a lad. <laughs> yes. <laughs> a saint he ain't. <laughs> no. But here we yeah. see how good can still come out of something that makes millions and millions of dollars. Um, films are like text, they, they communicate a message. And so, um, one of my fields of expertise is hermeneutics. So I did my PhD at Glasgow University in postmodern literary critical circles, and um, hermeneutics are different ways of interpreting text. And so um, the interpretive process is like this: we have a text, uh, which is the movie. Um, the movie uh, speaks to an audience, um, and uh, the reader, so to speak. And that equals a message. And it's interesting, too, because not everyone will get the same, exact same me um, message. Yeah. OK, there's freedom and constraint. Uh, so there's a dynamic relationship between the movie and the audience. So again, uh, there's freedom to interpret the play Hamlet, but there are constraints. It's, Hamlet is not a, a movie, a Shakespearean movie, about a Scottish king. It's not. Uh, so there are certain constraints. We, we can't let, uh, we, it's kind of when people say, well, you can make the Bible say whatever you want. That's false. There's a certain economy of words. There's, you may have, a, my Hebrew students hate this, this word has a wide semantic range. You may have a wide semantic range, but there's only so many meanings that a word can have. And there's only so many ways in the syntax, the way the mm -hmm. sentence is organized, that will determine, that will provide constraints on meaning or interpretation. So, and what about experiencing uh, religious, the religious through media? Uh, so we watch, 
we reflect, and it's a powerful experience. So that's what was happening with me on um, Good Friday um, of this year. Um, I'm watching, I'm thinking. Again, John and Liam hate watching movies with me because I have to provide a theological commentary all the time, etc. Or suspension of disbelief is not always there, but it should be. <laughs> And movies, uh, they are experiential, so, and, and this relates to the idea of existentialism, so Kierkegaard is considered the father of existentialism, that our experiences are subjective, they're personal, they're individual, uh, and they can be quite different. I wouldn't want to push that too far, by the way, um, but you can have an existential encounter, uh, this is what Bart would talk about, and I don't agree with this, by the way, I agree with it in some sense. He says. The Word of God doesn't become the Word of God until you have an existential experience with it. I think the Word of God objectively just stands on its own, and mm -hmm. that's it. You know, Whether we subjectively believe that Jesus is coming back or not will not change things. One eye over it. He'll just come back. Um, having said that, <clears throat> we can only experience things as individuals. We're born into the world alone, we die alone, etc. Um, so, we can look at the idea of Schindler's List. So, the, by the way, this is very theoretical because I told you I've not seen the movie uh, for specific reasons. So, I'm just I'm talking about what scholars have told me here. Uh, so, Schindler's List is being compared with the call of Isaiah. Isaiah, in the year that King Uzziah died, 742 BCE, he sees Yahweh high and lifted up. Um, and the temple, and his robe is filling um, the uh, temple, and um, it's a, it's a, it's a numinous, it's a very emotive uh, kind of scene. And so, from and I, but I have talked with plenty of people who have seen Schindler's List, and they they have had this encounter, this overpowering experience of the numinous. And here we see how religion. Uh, ethics and human rights all intersect. It's, so, I mean, here's where uh, freedom of conscience and freedom of speech doesn't make you right. And so, uh, one of the worst things, I, I've been to the Holocaust Museum in Jerusalem. I've been to the Holocaust Museum in Berlin just last year. The Holocaust is one of the most documented historical events of all time. And so Holocaust deniers, it's just, as far as I'm concerned, it's a no-go uh, zone. And what Schindler's List uh, teaches us is that you see this combination of religion, ethics, and human rights. Okay, so the sacred through uh, the secular. So this is back to Thomistic uh, theology, general revelation, a kind of a sacramental view. Uh, and that begins with the intellectual. We have the shaping or questioning, or the question, more like the questions of theology. And uh, then within the movie, we have a basic uh, theological framework to think about what's going on. Um, back to the idea of a holistic framework, God uh, in everything. I'm not talking pantheism, by the way. No. Uh, God speaking and being experienced in everything. So I'm, I'm not exaggerating and I'm not joking when God first started speaking to me through the Holy Spirit in the horror movie Friday the 13th. I had this numinous experience that materialism was not the sum total of existence or reality. Having said all that, Sola Scriptura as a benchmark keeps its place and its authority. That is the benchmark by which we measure all truth, morals, and values. It's very, very important. Graham goes on to talk about the primacy of the visual, um, so physiologically and culturally. It's very interesting because when I was touching up this lecture, Last year, I was in the bookstore photocopying something, so I picked up Aristotle's Complete Works. <laughs> and I just started going through his book on physics. And uh, lo and behold, if he didn't talk about this uh, the primacy of the visual, um, 
that our most important sense is visual. Uh, we know that there's a difference between men and women. Uh, men, these are generalities because some women are visual learners, but typically men are visual learners and women are audio uh, learners. Uh, so that raises some questions about the validity of Aristotle. Um, what is the word? In the beginning was the logos. The logos was the word. What are words? Words are ideas. And the idea was with God and the idea was God. Um, so part of this, however, leads to a fear of idolatry. So um, it's why in some particularly orthodox branches of Judaism, uh, or even my seminary prop, my Old Testament prop, he wouldn't, he wouldn't have an image of Jesus up anywhere. Uh, he's a Baal, he's from Texas. Baal. <laughs> There's no physical description of Jesus in the New Testament. And uh, so he's iconoclastic. Uh, and, uh, you know what? I, I've thought about that for many years. And I can see some validity in it. But I think also, I didn't have a chance to do Stronger Winker Brothers or Degrees of Faith or how uh, something can be true for one person, one Christian, and not true for another Christian. Um, I mean, homeschooling would be an example of that. It could be right for some Christians, but it's not right for my wife and I. Um, but we're supposed to respect one another uh, and where we're coming from. So it opens up a very complex um, bag of, of, of difficult issues. Um, ironically enough, <coughs> I, I used to, um, when I was just back at Bible College, I used to go down to the Roman Catholic Church in the St. Pius in Sherbrooke. And I used to sit at the foot of the cross, I had a big crucifix. Um, and at that time I was in the evangelical tradition, so the idea of, we don't need Jesus on the cross! <laughs> <laughs> that sort of idea. So there, of course, there's all kinds of anti-Catholic stuff built into that. I used to have some powerful prayer times there. I was not worshipping a thing or an idol, um, but the aesthetic and the image was very powerful uh, in prayer and reflection. So Aristotle and even Graham would argue this, seeing proceeds Speech, but I just ask you to confer THX. THX is an audio company that George Lucas came up with because he wanted to make Star Wars uh, be a total experience, not only a spectacular visually, but in terms of sound. And I remember watching it in the Golden West Drive-In. And that was just the <laughs> thunder of a ship flying across. So, um, what's my point here? Uh, we, we have to be skeptical and don't question every idea. And then we have to kind of figure out uh, where to place it. Movies are an effective art. And what Graham means by that is that it affects our emotions before our intellect, logic, and rationality. Um, so here's an image from Avatar. It's a very beautiful film, as I, as I mentioned uh, before. Um, or an Angel says, movies are felt long before they are understood. So remember, most people, they're, they're unguarded. They go to have fun, to be entertained and the like. Um, but they have an effect on us before we even realize what they've done. But we cannot underestimate the power of film to stimulate, convince, and affect the viewer. Uh, this is essentially my fellow Canadian James Cameron's. It's a very thinly veiled piece of political propaganda. I can see Alberta oil sounds. <laughs> and I found it very ironic that when he toured the uh, oil sands, he did so in one of the biggest gas guzzling helicopters on the face of the planet. <laughs> <laughs> and so when I teach uh, green theology, my Old Testament theology course, uh, what we see in Genesis 1 is that we have stewardship. We don't actually own anything. No. We get to use stuff. And God wants us to use stuff. But he also wants us to look after stuff. And so I think that it has to be a very balanced point of view. 
but before people have even figured out that they've been hoodwinked, they're gone. They've already been programmed. Okay, back to suspension disbelief. Um, these are the unbelievable parts about movies that you have to just kind of, just go with it, Bill. <laughs> this is a willful act. It's not like we're being duped or we're naive. Uh, it, it's rather allowing ourselves to be drawn into the film. Um, having said that, I just have a hard time going with things. I really do. It doesn't matter what it is. It took me so long to get around to zombies because I'm so skeptical and questioning them that I needed time to figure it out. It's part of the problem with me teaching pop culture is because by the time I figured it out, it's passe. <laughs> it's no longer pop. Um, but I am always critically engaged. A hermeneutic of suspicion, again, doubts everything that we're being told. And ideological criticism, all texts have a political agenda. It doesn't matter what text it is. So one of the things that I try and teach my students, particularly in reading seminars, uh, and some of them I do specifically, like in archaeology, biblical archaeology, I teach them the uh, ideological criticism, which ironically is a postmodern literary critical technique to discern political agendas and texts. And I use that to deconstruct their own ideology. <laughs> it says we can't know anything for sure and that um, it's, a, it's just a different political agenda that's, that's going on. I, I can't help but function that way. Um, so, the visual power of film can scarcely needs to be argued. So again, that, it's just such a beautiful and effective film. Okay, Graham then goes on to talk about film as a stimulus for theology. So. First of all, it presents religious themes and visual form. That's what you're going to see in Blade Runner, or Prometheus, or The Matrix. These are the, the big seminal texts in theology of the movies. They don't have to be explicitly religious. So, for example, with Kevin Sherwin and his zombie music and the theology that's in there, I think most of what we hear in his music is subconscious. Uh, he grew up in a Roman Catholic home. Uh, he has wandered away. But he is asking these big questions. He's presenting religious themes through his zombie music and video games. So it doesn't have to be explicitly. The Crash is another movie uh, that's a good example of that as well. Okay, it raised, they raise questions about human nature, experience, or destiny. So, you see how we're a very conflicted, if not contradictory, culture. Because on the one uh, hand, we want to be individuals, we want to be free, we want to have choice, etc. Unless, well, it was just meant for him and I to get married. I just know this. <laughs> destiny. Or when our life is in the toilet, uh, we feel constrained by uh, destiny. Um, Dominic Crossan is, uh, he's a laicized priest, I've known a, a couple of these, That's, uh, because uh, in Roman Catholic theology is one of the seven sacraments and you can't ever revoke it, so when you stop functioning as a priest, you become, you're always a priest, you become laicized. Um, any of the priests that I've met have been laicized, have been for other, <laughs> for other, other reasons. Okay. Um, Are you saying lay aside? Yeah. Or no, lay aside. Lay aside. Yeah. Become lay. Oh. oh. I thought lay or something. <laughs> <laughs> oh, okay. Sorry. Lay aside. Okay. Okay. It might be lay. I'm, I'm, I'm so quite lay. tired and okay. struggling. I think a little bit with allergies or a cold mm -hmm. or something. Um, Dominic Crossan is someone that I treat with a great deal of caution. He is also a member of the Jesus Seminar. Uh, I have nothing but problems with uh, them, and I have a lot of problems with him. Having said that, and look, Nora can tell you, can you learn from people you disagree with? Mm -hmm. Not if you're not closed-minded, not if you've already predetermined, not if you've already shut off their ideas. Uh, he talks about myth and parable, and so uh, myth establishes the world and parable subverts it. So myth, 
uh, it provides us with the etiology of origins. Where do we come from? Um, that's a big question. It's not a coincidence that Genesis starts with a creation account. You have that same in the Enuma Elisha Babylonian creation account, uh, the Atrahashish epic, etc. It's, it's about status quo as well. It's about maintaining our social and theological and emotional psychological uh, balances. So what you, want, what you don't want from a myth is to be challenged or stimulated to think too hard. And essentially what it does is it confirms what we already believe and ultimately that leads to comforting us. Parable, however, uh, undermines or questions the very ground that we stand on. Jesus' number one teaching method was parable. So Jesus would say something, it's like, parables are like little time bombs as well. You just like, drop that thought in your head and then you walk away. You're going back after the sermon on the mount and you're, oh, okay, right, <laughs> right, okay. Um, so Jesus challenged the religious and ethical practices and attitudes of the hearers. Um, movies function, Graham argues, in one of two ways. It's either a myth, so in that we have, this is what is Cinderella. So Cinderella is familiar. Um, it's, it's very comforting because we, we know it's going to end happily ever after, right? Uh, we have old ideas. In new form. So this was originally oral, and it was written down. We have uh, animated versions of it, and we have realistic versions of them. So uh, Prometheus, for example, uh, is Ridley Scott's um, epic myth on origins, and. You have to watch the two-hour documentary on the making of Prometheus. It's really very interesting. There's a book come out on the philosophy of Ridley Scott. So serious philosophers are weighing in on him. Um, and we talked about Ridley Scott. He grew up in the Church of England. He was an army brat. Uh, he was an altar boy. He hates Christianity. He hates organized religion. He gave us Kingdom of Heaven and the like. And uh, he gave us Blade Runner. But really he is, I think, again, this subliminal, the subconscious outworking of real questions and problems that he has. Because he hates Christianity on the one hand, but he can't get rid of it. <laughs> it's very ironic. Uh, why would that be? So, you know, he essentially tells the etiology, the origins. Of course, he's bought into the idea of aliens. We come from aliens. And this is the engineer. So Wayland is a multi-billionaire who funds this trip uh, to find um, uh, his creator. And ironically, one of the main characters, I think we're going to look at Elizabeth Shaw in a second. Um, when he gets to meet him, he is a mean, destructive person. And they're creating these aliens as bioweapons to destroy the Earth. So you have to think about the flood. So what he does, it's parabolic in terms of replacing the Christian myth with alien creators, uh, mean engineers. So it's saying a lot about who Ridley Scott is. Okay, so movie is parable. It subverts the familiar in both form and function. It is discomforting. It is provocative. It forces us to think. So a movie, um, can we go back? Uh, one. Uh, this is from the movie Stigmata. I think it was 1999 this came out. Uh, this is uh, Patricia Arquette. And uh, it's about an atheist who experiences the stigmata. Uh, she has the religious experience of bleeding from the wounds. And uh, so, and it's not a coincidence, you see the light behind her, and she is stretched out, she is suffering. And then next, next scene here. Um, it's provocative. It's deliberately there to provoke our thinking. And um, what essentially it is telling us is that uh, here is an atheist having a religious experience, and they're just as saved. So what's the message? What's the implication? We don't need God. 
I'm okay, you're okay. And that has, a, most people are not thinking in the movie theater, but I guarantee you that kind of messaging is inside their head. Okay, the religious in film. So now we're going to get to Paul Schrader. And his MA thesis was uh, Transcendental Style of Film. And there he argues beyond normal sense experience and by definition, eminent. Um, that's, I put a question mark behind that because it seems a little bit uh, contradictory. Having said that, uh, human beings are not always logically consistent. <laughs> and he may be a very brilliant man, but he wrote Taxi Driver with a ball of vodka in one hand and a 45 caliber pistol in the other. He was either going to write that script or he was going to blow his brains out. Um, so he's saying the movies are, some, are going to give us an experience uh, beyond the everyday. Okay, we need uh, new ways uh, to express religious and non-traditional ways. So he's definitely in the post-Christian category. Um, I'm going to run a little scene here uh, about the harsh reality of dysfunctional pietistic family. And this is semi-autobiographical. Um, so I'll just, I'll just set up the scene for you. Uh, this is a scene uh, that as a pastor I've been many times before. It, they are moments that I cherish. I had them with my mother and my father when they were passing away. I've done it as a pastor many, many times. And um, so Joan Jett is the daughter, but she's a rebel. She's had a child out of wedlock. You're going to find out who the father is in this scene. But her mother is dying from cancer. Her dad's kind of a wampa, wet rag. Uh, her mother is just a really overbearing, strict Christian. Um, we have very good friends in Scotland that we love very, very much. Uh, but we don't do pastor's wife syndrome, or we don't do pastor's kid syndrome. Um, my son is a kid. Uh, we have certain boundaries and expectations from him but uh, we don't put any additional pressures uh, on him. Um, and one of the things too that we tried to walk is this balance because our friends were so strict in church that all three of their adult children are atheists that hate the church. Church was such a bad experience for them. Their upbringing was so bad for them. And these were very sincere, loving people and it can happen. And so this is the kind of home. So this is Gina Rawlings. It's a brilliant performance here. But Joan Jett is in a band with her brother, uh, played by Michael J. Fox. And this is, she's, she's going to die pretty soon here. And she's just having this last little conversation. with this. When, I, when I first ran this in Theology of the Movies, you know, many, many years ago, we got to the end and there was two girls and they were just sobbing. I said, what's wrong? That's my family. That's the house I grew up in. So. What is this from? Uh, Light of Day. Um, so, and she's going to explain where the baby came from. <laughs> and, uh, and then we'll talk a little bit about it. But you tell me if it's powerful. Cool. They're estranged by the way they want to would be very happy together. I'll suggest it to him. I know this is hard. But I'm telling you because you understand. You're so strong. You're stronger than Joe. You're always so strong. I nearly died giving birth to your cesareans were more dangerous than Oh, God, I'm labor is it. He better be watching that you were. You were. Mother, I know you've always wanted to know who Benji's father was. It was John. Ansley. Reverend Ansley. I never told him. 
You said he was a good influence on me. Well, it was him. Reverend Anson? You're forgiven. I never believed any of the terrible things that people said about you. I always believed in you. You were always special. You were the one that I loved the most. Didn't you know that? You're a mother now, too. It's not always easy. Is it? Maybe you've said or done something. Have I done anything so terrible that I can't be forgiven? No. Oh. Oh. There's one last thing. Because I knew whoever wrote that, that was not an imaginary thing. That was a lived experience. And so the question that I always had about that scene, Paul Schrader answered uh, 10 years later when I was living in Scotland, watched an interview with him, and he talked about this very scene. And I was sitting on the edge of my seat because that was his scene with his mother when she died. Promise me you'll be with me in heaven. Yes. Be loved. It doesn't overturn the powerful uh, experience, the theology there. It tells me that he's a person that needs prayer and love. It also, you know, the tremendous responsibility that we have as parents. And, and we can't, we, and you know, it was beautiful. I mean, we all make mistakes as individuals, as parents. Have I done anything so bad I can't be forgiven? You know? um, so, uh, the purpose of transcendental art and film is to express the holy. So, yeah, I very much... When I first saw that movie, it was 2.50 Tuesdays, so that's back in the 80s in the Bible college, and I'm dating myself. I was expecting to go see a comedy because Michael J. Fox is in it, right? And that movie rocked my world. Um, so, uh, we also see uh, Taxi Drivers, another one of his movies. It's a very disturbing film. 
Um, but some scholars have pointed out it's got the five points of Calvinism, the tulip form of total depravity, uh, unconditional election, limited atonement, um, uh, irresistible grace and perseverance of the saints. Of course, now I'm going to be accused of being a crypto-Calvinist because I'm a tulip form. <laughs> okay, there we go. Um, using film and theology to provoke religious experience. I had similar experience. I didn't grow up in a Christian home. My parents became Christians when confronted with their own mortality. Um, I suspect there's a lot of more deathbed confessions than a mama would feel comfortable with. But I, who am I to judge that? Um, So I lived my parents dying through that movie, through that scene. Again, as a pastor, I've been there many times with it. Um, so, oh, there's so many other things that we could talk about. Um, it can provoke religious experience, personal, subjective, existential. Uh, one of the scenes in The Fifth Element is unbelievable uh, because she's a Christ figure. Um, she's the savior of the world. Uh, but in, as she's coming to consciousness of who, who she really is, she starts to watch the history of the world on a computer. Um, it's a futuristic science fiction movie. And when she sees all the war and violence and hatred, there's this innocence about her. And it really, so one of the topics that um, specifically on that is incarnational theology in the fifth element. And uh, how there are many theological themes and uh, um, questions that you can get out of it. But it's very, very powerful. Uh, it reminds me of God and Yahweh in Genesis 6. Uh, Every inclination of the heart was only evil, and the whole earth was filled with violence. And she's watching this, and the tears are just screaming. It's very, very powerful. We also can explore uh, themes, um, theological themes, like dystopia. So, I mean, this is something that we see um, in Blade Runner, you'll see it, you see it in The Matrix, uh, the Terminator series. Uh, dystopia, it's, it's the opposite of utopia in Thomas More's book. Um, it's, it's, it's our worst nightmare, and we are the authors of it. And it usually comes through uh, abuse of technology. Okay. It can challenge us, uh, using film and theology, to challenge received wisdom of religious traditions. So The Scarlet Letter is a book, but also a movie with uh, Demi Moore in it. And theology needs to say uh, uh, old things in new ways, or it will cease to be relevant or interesting. So that's one thing that I talk quite a bit. Theology is, Martin Luther is an example of creative theology, not the end of creative theology. It's, all theology is contextual, it's an ongoing, it's a creative uh, task. That makes it interesting and, um, I think, uh, accessible. I think, you know what, that's... I think I'll just leave it there. Read the conclusions for yourself. <laughs> so questions or comments? When you talk about dystopia, I can't help but think of the two most popular current movie series, the um, Divergent um, series and the other one that's kind of the same. Um, Hunger Games. Hunger Games. Yeah. Um, with that dystopia that's been created through yeah. human folly and, and imperfection, yeah. and then we're left to deal with the aftermath, but there's no... There's no hope for anybody except through their own means. Right. It's building a Tower of Babel. That's actually what Blade Runner is about. It's really building it. it. We'll talk about that next week. Blade Runner is 
based on Frankenstein, which is based on Paradise Lost. And essentially, it's what happens when we play God with science. Um, sure, Adam and Eve, they knew good and evil. The problem is, is they can't control it. And that was my point. Did we talk about Plato last time? It's the fundamental flaw in the Republic. Uh, if we could just educate people that they're, if you do naughty things, you'll get a bad consequence, would just change. And we'll look at the Book of Judges. Everyone did what was right in their own eyes. I mean, people see their own destructive behaviors, and they just keep going. Why is that? Because of original sin. And so the Tower of Babel is, um, it's essentially the Garden of Eden. Pride, they can make a name for themselves, and, they, and she took and she ate, and they built a tower to heaven. Um, and it's, it's, a, it's a dead end, because you can't build a tower high enough to God. And that's why Genesis 12, it's about God's initiative, it's about God's grace, and I will make your name great, Abraham. Not like those fat, phony Babylonians. I'll make your name great. So it raises the question, why? I think we're so stressed out, I think we're so busy, What Richard Winters is a Christian psychiatrist, still bored in the age of entertainment, with the most entertained culture on the face of the planet, with the most bored, depressed, and suicidal. Why is that? Like, entertainment's supposed to be fun, isn't it? Well, you can go to all the movies you like, but if you don't have Jesus in your heart, <laughs> you'll never feel satisfied. There isn't enough sex to make you feel satisfied if you don't have Jesus in your heart. There isn't enough pumpkin pie. Surely that can't be true. <laughs> <laughs> um, and it, it is like the book of Judges. People see their own destructive behavior, and that's what the dystopia is about. It's really the subcon. That's what the zombie apocalypse is all about. People know this. But they still want to do it themselves. They'll use guns, they'll use technology, they'll use robotics, they'll go to distant galaxies and planets. And that's what Augustine says, there's a God-made vacuum in our hearts and it doesn't rest until it's in there. But on the flip side, the positive side, so that's the law, that's the bad side. I am hopeful about it in the sense that what it is telling me is that at least people are thinking at it at some level. They figured it out in some level. And so to me, it, it's a tremendous opportunity for mission and evangelism. But we can't do that if we don't understand where our culture is coming from. I mean, it's not a mistake. Like at International Hawk School in Liebenzell, I mean, they do cross-cultural missionary work. Well, they do a lot of cultural anthropology and sociology. And there's a reason for that. It can help. We have to have compassion for these people, too. I mean, when I watched that scene, I, I just made my heart heavy for Paul Schrader. And it's, a, it's an act of rebellion, which is, again, back in the garden. Any more questions? Comments? See you next week. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.